Hello. Today's lesson is going to be on the AC Level 1 exam on budgeting costs and cost control. So here we go. This is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, and as, as we've done in the other modules, the format is we will go through the uh, actual manual itself. I've got things highlighted that I think are important to uh, understand about the text and then I will bring in different examples to illustrate some of these concepts. So uh, not sure how many of you out, out there have already been working in an estimating function or a cost management function. Probably not very many folks but when you do these will be the kinds of things that you'll be dealing with. So. So the most important aspect of this is to understand that uh, your system goes from the estimate to the budget. So there needs to be compatibility uh, from one mode to the other, from estimate to budget. And so again, in estimating, we've used CSI codes, and budget codes are often set up to align with those. Um, now, the one difference is, is that uh, you will typically have major cost types within a budget that will cover things like labor, material, equipment, subcontractor costs, each assigned to a specific code. There's a few other designations that you can break it down into, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but these are the basic ones labor, material, equipment, and subcontractor um, cost. So um, the, the main thing you need to realize is that uh, these things will align with the CSI divisions and you see here they're showing different types of cost codes uh, as you start implementing the project. Um, that show how it would marry back to the estimate. Um, the work breakdown structure again is in smaller, more manageable packages. And what they're talking about here, this is important uh, right here, these items right here. I'm gonna highlight these. So the, um, when you break down into smaller work packages, uh, there shouldn't be any overlap of scope between the different work packages. In other words, they are unique work packages in and of themselves. So as you noticed over here, you've got sidewalks as one aspect, and then you go to stairs on grade. So these are like different, separate, distinct areas that are gonna be implemented. And any time, as a general rule, that you want to um, be able to track something, it's always better to, to break it down into the smallest component possible because it's just human nature that it's easier to manage something small than it is to manage something that's large, okay? So uh, each package should have a definitive start and end time. There shouldn't be any overlap of cost between the work packages, and you should be able to measure the progress uh, precisely. Uh, this business, the construction business, is all about monitoring progress and being able to measure results. So it's a very quantitative industry. It, it always comes down to, can you track what's going? Can you project what your final costs are going to be, and are you on target to meet your original budget, okay? It should be important to understand that work breakdown structures, right here, are not a schedule. They are simply a way to organize, and you use work breakdown structures in both uh, budgets and in scheduling. So that's an important component to realize there. I want to show you real quick something here uh, as an example when we're talking about going from estimate to budget. So this is just an excerpt from a budget and you can see it's done by work breakdown structure here. You can see that. Uh, you've got your quantities 
and then you've got your total amount and it goes by the CSI codes as you can see as you go down the page. We want to translate that into, and here's a sample of the budget, it's not for the same scope but you get the idea. Uh, budgets ha will give you a cost type which is what we talked about before, equipment, labor, material, uh, subcontracts, purchase orders, um, indirect costs. We, we actually at Tullipson have a cost type for indirect costs, which is all your labor burden, your bonds, I'm sorry, your bonds, your insurances, things that are applied on top of the total number so that you can track those. But you see very differently how this may give you a sum total in quantity. Your budget itself will have columns such as the original budget, uh, all of these columns here, right here, deal with the budget. They do not deal with cost. And one of the things that's unique about the AIC examples is they will kind of not put all the budget categories over in one place or put all the cost categories in another place. They kind of intersperse them amongst each other and mingle them. Uh, for me, it's easier to, and, and as I've taught other students and other coworkers in the past, it is so much easier to, when you're dealing with cost reports, to think about budget and, and cost as two separate things. Um, if you try and think about a budget and then you go and switch and say, okay, well my budget is X and my current cost is Y and my projected is going to be this, it's much harder to keep that train of thought. So when you're updating your cost reports, it's critically important to remember that budget is just a placeholder. You've got X number of dollars to spend on a project. You cannot exceed the total amount of budget. You may make internal changes. Let's say, for instance, on cost of work here in this example, uh, you can see they've made an internal change of adding $12,000 to it uh, because they might have picked up money somewhere else and realized that they needed more staffing and so the vehicles wouldn't cost more, so they're going to increase this amount and they will go down on another amount, like right here, enclosures and barriers. Notice this went down by 36, almost $36,000. Okay, so I digress. But anyway, let's get back to the budget. I've shown you the budget columns here. Okay, then you notice you go and you deal with cost. What the actual cost this period is, what the cost to date is, what you've committed to date, not what you've actually spent to date, but what you've committed to subcontractors and vendors, and then the, the amount left to be confirmed. Now, these two columns here, committed to date and to be committed, actually are pretty close to tracking your buyout of the project when you go to award subcontracts. And then you've got here your projected cost, which is the job of the project manager to go in and say, okay, it's cost me you know, in this particular example, uh, my cost to date on vehicles is almost $26,000. Uh, am I going to run that amount? Is it going to be the same? Oh, it's showing right now that it's 100% complete. So I'm going to stand pat with that is my projected number. Okay? Um, and the over-under is your over-under of your, your projected cost to your current budget. Now, another thing I want to point out is the difference between internal changes and external changes. Internal changes, as I said, are like realigns. They are how you're reshifting the budget monies that you have. External changes are more like uh, change orders, change in scope from your owner, um, or that are initiated by the architect. So that's how those actual things are different and should be categorized. Okay, so let's move on down here. Let's go talk about the work breakdown structure just for one second. It's very important to remember that 
the work breakdown structure should drill down to more specific detail as you break down into smaller levels. So this triangle demonstrates that where at the top it's at the broadest basis scope. Notice in this example it's the whole building. Then you're breaking it down into site work, substructure, mechanical, and I think that's exterior. I'm having a hard time reading that. And then level three gets down even more granular into plumbing, fire protection, and HVAC from the mechanical. And then the HVAC drills down more specific in ductwork, chillers. I think that's supposed to be et cetera. I think somebody misspelled et cetera. And then chillers, then you have shop drawings, delivery, and install. So you can see at each level as you, as you go down the list of your WBS, it gets more specific. Um, your labor cost report, these are things that deal with uh, the actuals as compared to the budgets, just like I've shown you on the previous example. We've already talked about CSI division. Um, and here's an example of what I'm demonstrating. The budgets are happen to be the columns that are highlighted in yellow in this did not highlight well. It went, uh, <laughs> it went completely 100%, so you can't see it. I'm going to take it off momentarily here. So those are all actual budgets, okay? The, this column, it's your budgeted quantities. This is your budget total dollars and this is your budget unit cost. So it's taking your total um, divided by your quantities to come up with your unit cost. Uh, the white columns, not these that I had already marked up, are all related to cost columns. And then your projected is related to red. That's how I've got it highlighted. So again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Right here, I am trying to demonstrate the point of it's always comparing your budget that you have to work with versus what you're actually doing the work for, your cost, and then projecting what your, your final outcome is going to be. Um, those are pretty self-explanatory. You can look at these things, but that was the main point I had to, to do there. Um, the whole point is in creating a, eventually a project cost summary report. So you, you'll have detail reports where you get very granular, but the project cost summary report is what tells the project manager and the people that the project managers report to what your total overall project is going to cost. And I'm going to show you an example here. This is a summary cost report, and you can notice it's got the E for equipment, L for labor, M for material, P for purchase orders, S for subcontracts, W for work orders, and I for indirects. And it comes up here and it gives you a total of this job. So right now, this job, projected final cost, is 39 point five million okay and the current budget is thirty nine point two million which leaves you a balance uh, of the fee so these are all costs remember you have to account for your fee on the job and basically your fee is your contract minus your um, your costs um, Right now, it's, it's, uh, we, there's been some over-unders. You can notice right here on this line, on the subcontract line, uh, there's been $441,000 worth of changes in this particular job. So uh, there was some good buyout on this job, uh, the way that it was treated. And then we almost always like to break out the general conditions separately because that is something that is uh, basically... Uh, labor and time induced and um, 
it's something the contractor controls, so we always like to look at that as a separate number. So this is an example of your, your summary report. Here's their version of it here that you can see. They're pretty much the same. The one I just showed you has more uh, cost types in it. But it, they both forms do the same. They're essentially the same form. They're just, one's just got a little bit more information on it than the other. The next thing that we need to talk about is we're going to go into getting your money, <laughs> which in order to get your money, you have to be able to create a schedule of values. And here's an example of some schedule of values. This is on the AIA format, which is pretty commonplace and expected to be done on almost all commercial jobs. Uh, again, you've got your CSI codes over here, your description of work, and then it goes into the scheduled value. This has to do with uh, how much you've previously billed for, how much is in place this period, basically that month. If there's any materials stored, they go in this column, and then you have your total completed to date gives you a revised percent of what that total line item is worth in terms of the percent complete, gives you a balance to finish, and then of course it has a column that withhold shows how much is being withheld for the retainage amount. The retainage being typically five to 10% uh, as dictated per your agreed upon contract and it is meant to protect the owner in the event that things are not completed to the owner's satisfaction at the end of the job. Okay. Um, let's talk next about, let's see. The next thing we wanna do is talk about cost-loaded schedules. Uh, in the um, in the industrial sector, okay, I'm going to show you my pretty industrial picture. There we go. It is very commonplace in the industrial sector to require cost-loaded schedules, and it's because they're so uh, labor-intensive. Uh, and trade intensive, uh, it's a little bit different method of procurement. In commercial construction, you're going to procure by the trade with subcontractors. They're going to submit their own set of schedule of values to you that you have to approve for payment each time. And uh, whereas on industrial projects, it is a lot more labor intensive, but intensive because you're dealing with a lot of man hours, you're dealing with a lot of piping, uh, mechanical type situations uh, so and they also have the propens propensity for the type of work that they do to work dual shifts so scheduling becomes a really important aspect in industrial construction so one of the things that they like to have is cost loaded schedules and this is an example of what one would look like this is from P6 and you can see here that by uh, what they've done is they've cost loaded this particular item, clearing and grading, and you can show, see that they show how much money would be allocated for each month of the job. And then P6 creates a corresponding graph of how that's gonna come across in terms of dollars. Um, they also then go into resource loaded. This is a, this is a pretty one. I like this. <laughs> uh, it's a pain to do, but, uh, it, it's, it's a great way to track, uh, a project to see how it's running. Uh, a, to make sure that nobody's getting ahead of you on billings for one thing, but you can see that it's broken down by HVAC, electrical, drywall, uh, con uh, 
concrete, and then the conveying subcontractor. And this tells you how much each trade anticipates to put in work in terms of man hours. This is man hours, okay, by monthly period, okay? You're going to hear a lot about, and this is a histogram document, and we talked about that in a previous module with the AIC. You're going to hear a lot about the S-curve. This is basically what they're talking about here, this S-curve, because it kind of looks like an S on its side, the way it slopes and goes. Most projects, as a general rule, will follow this curve uh, in terms of execution uh, when built properly and not without a lot of stop gaps. Um, so uh, the other aspect of this is you can actually put in the number of man hours and then attach how much per man hour, and then it will also do the same thing as a cost-loaded schedule. So there's multiple ways to go about it. You can either do this, where you've got in the dollar amount, or you can come in here and actually assign hours and then dollars to each uh, roughly man hour uh, to create a schedule that's trackable. So that's fun stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we want to talk about here? Um, retainage, we've already talked about that. Front end loading, I mentioned that in our in our class. Um, front end loading is considered unethical. Uh, basically, you know, if you are a smaller contractor and you don't have very good cash flow, um, it's kind of like, let's say when you get work done residentially, the residential contractor may ask for 50% down payment. They do that because they don't have the capital to fund their cash flow because it's on a much smaller scale. So if you don't, if you're not upfront about that with your client and you create your schedule of values and you put more money up front in your schedule of values, and it's not a true representation of what it costs, but you're trying to create that, that superfluous cash flow, that's called front-end loading. And basically why it's considered unethical is that the owner is paying for more than the work that's been produced. So it's not a good practice. Um, not a good practice at all. Pass-through clauses are clauses that um, are a part of the contract between the general contractor and uh, the owner. And many, many contracts are written where, almost all of them these days, where the contractor, when they write a contract to the sub, it says that all the clauses that the general contractor is bound to by the owner so is the subcontractor. So those are called pass-through pass clauses. The one that relates to money is most often called pay when paid. So if it states in there that the general contractor is not obliged to pay the subcontractor until they have indeed been paid for that same scope of work by the owner. That's a pay when paid. Um, an indemnity clause, indemnifying the older, the owner of hold harmless in the event of a, a an accident or a financial uh, impact to the job, uh, is also considered to be a uh, pass through clause. Your final contract amount that is basically determined when you take care of. Um, change orders. Change orders are the only document that have the ability to add money to the contract. And if you don't have an executed change order for it, uh, it doesn't matter whether you've done it or not, they don't have to pay you for it. It is recognized in the court of law as a um, uh, the only way to account for agree, an agreement of the changes in scope, whether it's in physical scope, 
uh, as documented by ASIs and RFIs or whether or not it is a financial change in scope that has to be through a change order. Uh, the other things that are part of the final contract are back charges, which I think most of you are probably familiar with that. That is a tool by which, let's say a contractor, general contractor, needs to clean up an area and they've instructed all the subcontractors to clean that area after a week. And let's say that one of the subcontractors has not done so, then the general contractor has the ability to go in and clean it up for them and then send them a back charge for it because it was their responsibility to do their part to help that area cleaned up. This enables the job to stay on schedule and it also uh, uh, puts financial accountability where it is. A lot of times you'll see back, char back charges managed at the end of the job. I don't recommend that practice. I think it's good to stay on top of those things as you go so that you don't get to the end of the job and then have a, 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 a fight in terms of getting some sort of acknowledged agreement as to how much uh, is actually due to come back for that. The other thing that is not talked about in here is, and I want to bring this up because it's important, is contingencies and allowances. Um, a contingency is is generally identified in the very in the contract in terms of, let's say, you don't know what kind of stone you're going to buy yet uh, for countertops in a building, and so you may set up an allowance for the purchase of that stone. If it the stone that ends up being selected is more than what you had in the allowance then the owner has to reimburse the contractor for that. If it is less, then the general contractor has to give the balance of the money back to the owner. So it allows you to put in placeholders when you don't have all the work defined. Contingencies are also um, agreed upon contingencies and they're stipulated in the contract as to how those will get adjusted. So. There are some that are fully at the discretion of the contractor and some that have to have mutual agreement between the contractor and the owner before they are um, touched and allowed to be used. So that is another part of finishing out a project uh, is contingencies and allowance. And they didn't bring it up in the AIC manual, but I, wanted, I didn't want to lose that opportunity to uh, explain that to you. Liquidated damages, uh, one of the most important things about liquidated damages is that it's not a punitive penalty. It is, however, an understood agreement in the beginning of the project that there will be certain losses incurred by the owner if they can't occupy the building per the substantial completion date that's indicated that you've all agreed to in the contract. So liquidated damages are a means of uh, helping the owner uh, recoup certain loss costs. If you have liquidated damages in a contract, that is the most that an owner can request from the builder from being late. If you do not, and a lot of contracts will have uh, consequential damages. Consequential damages are much worse because consequential means that they can go in and analyze uh, how much lost revenue they had. Uh, if they had to hire more people uh, and those people were just sitting on the bench because they couldn't go to work, all those other costs can be added into it and that is generally a much larger number than liquidated damages. Liquidated damages can run anywhere from $500 a day to $5,000 a day uh, on average uh, from what I've seen in my 40 years of doing this, um, whereas consequential damages can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So a lot of times contractors will opt to put uh, negotiate to put liquidated damages in a contract so they don't have to be subjected to consequential damages. 
in the event that something goes haywire. So that is it. Uh, that is the whole module right here on budgeting, costs, and, and uh, cost control. Not too complex. Uh, very important uh, in terms of the financial aspect of the project as to whether or not you complete it successfully. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll, we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.